May the God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us be with us this day and remain with us always. Amen. Good morning. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. In the evangelical tradition, this verse is seen by many as the crux of Christianity that it is all about an individual's choice to believe a set of propositions about Jesus, to offer those allowed to pray them, that then ensures that a person will have access to eternal salvation, a process that is known by many as being born again. And I see this passage a bit differently. John 3.16, strangely famous as an end zone sign in football games, that it's not about us, at least not initially. It's not about what I may believe, rather it's about God. It's all about God's love for humanity being so deep and so wide that God would give of God's very self to save us, to forgive us, to make us whole. John 3.16 is about God, God's love, and God's forgiveness. And love and forgiveness are intertwined. One cannot be without the other. Love without forgiveness is short-lived, and forgiveness without love is impossible. And God in the person of Jesus embodies that love showing us how it's done so that we might embody that love for one another. More than 50 years ago in Perth, Australia, Kelly Connor was then 17 years old and she's had her driver's license for just three months. And that morning, Her dad was supposed to drive her to work at the telephone exchange, and instead he decided to take advantage of his daughter's newly found independence, and he gave her the car keys, and he slept in late. Remember those days when we'd just gotten our driver's license? I used to go to the grocery store for cat litter, and we didn't even have a cat. The neighbor did. I was very friendly. And there was Kelly, driving to work early in the morning, nervous and excited. And as she came up a hill, A taxi was pulled off to one side at the top of the hill, and Kelly was nervous and worried that the taxi driver might suddenly pull out. So in order to get past the cab quickly, she kept her foot firmly on the accelerator and her eyes to the side as she moved past it. And when she crested the hill, she watched back through the rear view mirror, making sure that she knew where he was. Finally, her eyes shifted back to the road ahead. And she says, when I looked forward, I saw an elderly lady in a green suit directly in front of me who was two-thirds of the way across the road in a pedestrian crossing. 
And I immediately hit the brakes, she said, causing her to look up in terror with absolutely no hope of success. She tried to outrun me. She said that I remember slamming on the brakes. I remember the sensation that the squealing tires made, but curiously, I don't recall hearing the actual noise. She said the noise of the impact is also also lost to me. I only remember the intense silence that followed it. She was lying on her stomach, unmoving, not far from the left tire. Surprisingly, there was no blood. She said, or at least none that I allowed myself to see. And Kelly says, I was was relieved that I didn't have to look at her face or to have her look at mine. And in the silence which followed, I could almost have convinced myself that it hadn't happened. But shaking uncontrollably, I managed to get out of the car and drape a blanket over the woman. That was as much as the efficient part of me could manage. Very quickly after that, the police and the ambulance arrived. And I was informed, she said later that morning, that Margaret Healy had died in the hospital at the police station. An officer gently guided Kelly to say that she'd been driving at the legal 35 miles per hour rather than the 45 miles per hour that she'd really been doing. And it was the policeman's way of protecting her. And it was the first time she experienced someone forgiving her. But it took a long time for her to see it that way. For many years, she said she wished she'd been punished Two weeks later, Margaret Healy's brother showed up at her house and wanted Kelly to know that no one in his family blamed her, and he was sure that Margaret would feel the same way. And as generous as it was, Kelly could not let herself accept his forgiveness. She couldn't forgive herself. Kelly was never tried for the woman's death, which compounded her feelings of intense guilt and shame. Her family very quickly fractured. Her mother decreed that they would never speak of it again, and her father, who felt terribly guilty for not driving her to work that day, left. And for nearly 20 years, Kelly, in fact, didn't speak of it. At one point, she was so convinced that she didn't have the right to continue living, she tried to end her life with suicide. Kelly avoided most relationships, and although she ventured into marriage, she soon left her husband, taking her two-year-old daughter with her. It was, however, she says, the birth of her daughter, Megan, which made her want to live again. When Megan was four, Kelly started on her journey towards self-forgiveness, and she tried to imagine how her life would have been without the accident. And during the process, she realized that she, that she was who she was because of Margaret Healy. But even allowing herself to consider forgiving herself brought up the full force of the guilt all over again. How can you be grateful for your life when you've killed someone? She writes, Megan knew nothing of the accident, but at age 14 I knew I had to tell her, otherwise the secret between us would corrupt our lives. And so she said, I told her, And Megan replied in a very matter-of-fact way, so 
This is why we live such a peculiar life. Okay, her daughter said, do you think we could start dealing with it now? And Kelly said, my daughter's acceptance led me to start dealing with my past. In 2001, she was asked to write a book about her experience, and going public terrified her. But she knew she had to do it to help others who were traumatized by the guilt of causing a death. In the book entitled To Cause a Death, the Aftermath, of an accidental killing resonated and letters started flooding in. It was a long journey towards forgiveness for Kelly, a life's journey. And it was Kelly's daughter's ability to understand and to still love her that actually finally allowed Kelly to begin forgiving herself There is something amazingly profound about being loved as we are in the messiness of who we are. It is John 3.16 in action. John 3.16 writ large to be loved for who we are as we are. To be loved, to be forgiven. That allows us to love ourselves to forgive ourselves for those things we've done. Unlike Kelly, so often, it's not so much major character flaws that need forgiving. It's those momentary lapses in judgment that can put in motion events with powerful consequences, powerful consequences and repercussions, both great and small. John 3.16 means that no matter what, no matter how much we screw up, our God will not shun us or condemn us or abandon us to the messiness of our lives. God is right here, loving, forgiving, leading us, beckoning us to wholeness. God's gift to us, and it can be also our gift to each other. Thanks be to God. Amen. Dear friends, life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.